Brian or uh, Ben, if we could start the recording. Sorry about yep, that. Yep, it's running now. Oh, you already did. Look at you. Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to session seven of Become a Cybersecurity Ninja. Today's session is a little privacy, please, and we're going to talk about what our technology already probably knows about us and what we can do to get back a little privacy if that's something uh, that we care about. And this cartoon that we have up on the front, I, I really love, and I this was in the New Yorker, I think like six months ago, or at least that's the first time I ever saw it. And this to me really sums up the issue because I think that the counter argument to people wanting to encrypt their personal emails or use VPNs on their home networks uh, is is often along the lines of, well, if you're not doing anything illegal, why are you trying to get privacy for your communications with other people? And for anyone who is posed with that question by someone and, and wants a more intelligible response than punching him in the face, which is something that I've uh, had to resist doing on occasion, this cartoon, just having a couple of copies of that in your pocket and just handing it to him, I think sums it up really nicely for me. So, uh, Yeah, I, I love this cartoon. The other thing that when I'm asked that uh, question in particular of why do you care about privacy? Laws clearly were not written for the internet age, and there are lots of them that, such as copyright, where we're infringing all over the place unintentionally, and it creates this ability for selective enforcement against individuals. And until uh, laws will never really catch up to technology, we need to allow people to innovate, do creative things, and rewrite those. But that surveillance culture cuts down on the innovation and creativity happening in culture overall. And gosh, I'm so glad to have you with us today, Brian. <laughs> it's a great perspective to bring to this, and I really appreciate that. And with that, so here's our title slide. And with us today is Brian Rowe, and I'm going to just skip through. We are at session seven, so everything in blue there is what we've gone through already. For those of you who have been here through every session, I love you, and thank you so much. And I hope that this uh, has been great for you and, and continues to be uh, really helpful. And we are coming up on the home stretch here. So in two weeks, we're going to do the, the Ninja Toolkit, and then we're going to do an incident response, and we're going to have that quiz and give out some prizes. So we are getting there. I, of course, am Joshua Pesky. I'm with Roundtable Technology. We do all sorts of technology stuff for nonprofits and small businesses around the country, but mostly in New York and Maine. And I'm going to let, let Brian take Feel free to take quite a bit more time than that to introduce yourself, Brian. Uh, no problem. Um, my name is Brian Rowe. I also go by Sart online or Sartorus on Twitter. Um, I work at Northwest Justice Project, helping legal services or organizations implement new technology. I also teach in the areas of privacy law, copyright, uh, remix, fair use, that type of stuff. So I love technology and there are so many opportunities here to do great things that privacy is one of those areas though, that unless we proactively protect it, it kind of disappears in our modern state, which is why I'm so happy to be part of this presentation. And I am so delighted to have you here with me, Brian, and thanks so much for joining us today. So our learning objectives today, we're gonna spend a little bit of time, and uh, this will be hopefully kind of entertaining for folks, talking about what your technology already knows about you. And uh, for those of you who aren't, uh, I would say, haven't done a lot of research on this topic, I'm gonna go ahead and, and suggest that you're gonna be surprised. Then we're gonna go into how to cut back on what you share and limit uh, what your technology will know about you. And then of course, some tools and services that can give you some privacy, our usual checklist of best practices, resources for further learning. And that's gonna be it today. And we'll try to keep the content to our usual half hour. Uh, my sense that will probably run a bit long today. So for those of you making planning, I, you might wanna plan on sticking around till 2.40, 2.45, just looking at the content we have. And of course, I wanna give Brian plenty of time to uh, provide, provide his input here. So what your technology already knows about you, uh, noise to signal, I wanna give huge props to them. They, uh, he, he does a lot of great, great cartoons, uh, Rob Cottingham. I was introduced to him through Beth Cantor. He did a lot of cartoons for her uh, Happy Healthy Nonprofit book anyway, and I, I love this cartoon. And I wanna go ahead and launch a poll. So uh, Ben, if you could go ahead and, and launch that one for everybody. And I just wanna know what you think. Do you think that Facebook knows your sexual preferences. And I'm gonna go ahead and give 
a yes, a no, a don't care, or a this question makes me uncomfortable, which is a perfectly reasonable response. And if you, for whatever reason, don't feel like answering this question at all for reasons of privacy, then by all means, uh, just just leave it blank and we'll, we'll leave that open for just a couple of seconds and see what people think. And uh, go ahead and close that up then. Let's, let's share the results. Overwhelmingly, people seem to think yes. So that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. We'll, we'll go and explore that a little bit and see, see what we come up with. So go ahead and close that up then and let's explore. So we're going to take a little time looking at this tool called Apply Magic Sauce produced by uh, University of Cambridge Labs. And this is something that is free and anybody can go ahead and do this. Brian and I, for those of you who are listening, we're talking about the different ways it can examine. If you can give it access to your Facebook profile and it will look at really just what you have liked, the things you have liked and use that to, to try to predict some things about you. You can also give it your Twitter uh, input and you can also give it uh, writing samples. So you can just take like an email you've, you've written, a couple of paragraphs, a paper you've written, and you can plug all of those things in or different things in and see what it will tell you. And here's what it will tell you. Uh, this is my magic sauce. So it, uh, and I should point out that I am going to share everything that it predicts about me. And before everybody worries that I'm giving away all of my own privacy too much, I want to say that I've liked in the entire history of my time on Facebook three things. I, I'm not a Facebook user for anyone who knows me. I'm not on social media generally. Uh, that's probably a big handicap when it comes to promoting webinars like this one. But I'm, <laughs> I'm just not an active uh, online uh, personality, and I, I don't engage with social media platforms really hardly at all. So this is based on, uh, I think I joined Facebook like seven years ago, a grand total of three likes. I don't even remember what they were, but there were three things, in, and all of those were probably in the first month I was a Facebook uh, person. All right, so I, it thinks I'm a bit on the conservative and traditional side, more than liberal and artistic, a little bit impulsive, a little bit, you know, nothing too serious here. Uh, it does predict how neurotic I am. Anyone, uh, Ben, we can go ahead and test that that one's completely wrong, right? I'm anything but laid back and relaxed, right? Usually stressed for the most. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, and well, then this, Brian. This what one is mine. Been, and yeah, I, I'm on the opposite end of the social media spectrum. I post two to three things every day on Facebook. I'm on Twitter all the time. It had hundreds, if not thousands, of likes uh, to look at here. And I also use their text analysis tool looking at my text writing on different websites and different social media. Uh, it was interesting that they tried to predict my age. On Facebook, I come out to be 29. On other sites, I'll go down as low as 20 and as high as 50 depending how much I talk about law. Um, the liberal part of this was definitely accurate. Some of the others were a little bit rough, but it was interesting looking through this that over 70% of the predictions were clearly right on, or at least how I see myself. Wow, okay. So the more data gets more accuracy, which would certainly make sense. All right. And so this is back to me now. Is there anything else you want to say on that, Brian, before I no, reveal more of myself here? I write mine kind of scarily in the background, and it's it's weird. It's it's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very it, it 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 comes within one year of my actual age, and pretty much hits it dead on the head. <laughs> so. Well, that's good. That's only going to make it hurt that much worse for me as we explore the rest of the things it tells me about me. And <laughs> so, it's, like, and it's that, only but... with Twitter because I don't have a okay. Facebook page. So, yes, that was very right. scary for me. <laughs> All right. So I um, you know how, how like 70 percent of people think they're like above average drivers, think think they're of above average intelligence. Well, uh, this this tool will tell me that I am you know, exactly average. <laughs> I am uh, I am more intelligent than only 49% of the population, so I am just slightly on the less intelligent side than than the average person, and I am a bit even more less satisfied with my life apparently. So I am uh, I am less satisfied with life. I like the way that it sort of puts these in a positive spin rather than saying you are less intelligent than 51% of the population. Uh, but, it, uh, it, <laughs> but you're it, a hard uh, worker. None, so. <laughs> yeah, nonetheless, hurts hurts a bit. So that that was a little painful. I got to be honest. Uh, and it guessed that I am single, which my wife uh, of 17 years is probably not delighted <laughs> to find out about. But uh, but it uh, it was wrong on that one certainly. But uh, it suggests that I'm single. And then we'll go to political orientation. 
uh, it uh, thinks that I, it, for weirdly, it, it lists the conservatives, the label there, but thinks I have liberal uh, political views. It, it had not much to go on. Does think I'm Christian. I'm Jewish, in case anybody's wondering. Uh, but I am not Catholic, Mormon, or Lutheran, which it thought I probably wasn't. And so I guess it was right on that. And then we finally get to sexual preference. So to answer the question, yes, Facebook does certainly have a guess as to whether you uh, have a sexual preference. That is, this is all, by the way, data that, that Facebook is guessing about you. And, and there's tens of thousands of different categories of things that they will put you in uh, to try to tell marketers things about you. And sexual, there's a I forget how many, but there's dozens of things around your sexual preference, your sexual likes, you know, the kinds of things that you're attracted to and so on and so forth. So anyway, um, I have about apparently an average uh, likelihood of being gay. So it is guessing my sexual preference. And so we have our answer there. And all this information is part of this idea of metadata. And very quickly, metadata just as a basic definition is in data about data, right? So you have a data point is, you know, Ben is 29 years old, right? But then data about that data, all right, is, well, where did we get this number that Ben is 29 years old? It came from, you know, his Android phone, which is 18 months old, which is running on this level of firmware and typically is located around Portland, Maine, and, you know, on and on and on is that data about the data that, that we have. And the more that we, you know, ever since smartphones really became so popular and people are hearing about this more and more, you know, we all put surveillance devices in our pockets. And I mean, if you look at it from the perspective of, let's say, you know, the NSA or the CIA or people that would like to have, or really more to the point marketers, Facebook, Google, et cetera, who would like to have as much information about us as possible. The fact that we as consumers not only will take a surveillance device and put it willingly in our pockets and carry it around with, it, with us and feed it information all day long, not only will we do that, but we will pay various uh, companies, you know, our, our mobile providers, the place we buy the phone from, all the apps that we pay for, all the services that we use, we will pay for the right to provide all of that surveillance data. When you kind of flip it on its head like that, it's, it's kind of shocking how willingly we, we all do that. And it, and it tells us all the things that you're seeing here in the slide and, and more. Brian, I'm gonna pause for a minute. So, and so to go back to on, to that. just a little bit on how much the services that we know um, or that we use know about us and the type of information that they have. Um, Netflix ran into a bunch of trouble a few years back. They had a contest that tried to improve their suggestion algorithm and they thought they had anonymized a bunch of data and made it available to the public so that they could try to come up with a way to do better suggestions. Uh, some smart people ended up looking at that anonymized data with a few data points and then combining it with publicly available IMDB um, reviews to pinpoint exact users and find out their sexual preference and their uh, interest in certain films that they were not reviewing that were of a much more personal nature than the ones that they were publicly reviewing. The amount of data that we give to pretty much anybody that we work with online or that we subscribe to is giant. And they have the ability to even take small amounts of that and find out so much more about us beyond what we give them by correlating other data points. Yeah. And on that note, actually, there was something on the cybersecurity world that just came out, uh, I think last week, Brian, where um, a researcher was able to detect with 99% accuracy what um, Netflix show or movie someone was watching just from watching the TCP stream. So without having to look at the computer, without having to hack anything, just looking at the TCP traffic flowing to the computer, they could they could predict with 99% accurate what show or movie they were watching on Netflix. So uh, interesting stuff that, that is out there. All right, so let's take a little bit of a deeper look at metadata just so people understand what it is. So you make a phone call to your mom and uh, this, I think, was done in Australia, these, these, these images. And Brian, uh, you can, we can talk about my violations of copyright laws. I go through and sort of grab these things off Google image searches and throw them in my webinars. But uh, 
But so who received the communication? So you call your mom and immediately we've got the two phone numbers involved, uh, probably an email address if it's connected to a, to a phone account, right? Because if I have the phone number, that's probably tied to an email account that is listed with that phone number. I have the IP address, uh, the network coming off of, I have, or of the phone. I have the unique identifying number, of course, the mom's phone. I have the date, time, duration of the communication. So at this time, these two people talked for X amount of time, and now they're linked. So the metadata that puts these two people together is two people that have talked to each other at this time of day from these two different devices, from these networks, that all becomes part of a data set about these two people um, that I can put together. And when you get into uh, surveillance around terrorism or criminal activities or things like that, this idea of your network, who you're connected to becomes really, really important because that's a lot of how it gets determined who gets looked at and who gets uh, surveillance on them. Uh, the communication type, so was it an SMS? Was it a phone call? Was it an email? Was it a voice over IP call? Or was it done over your carrier network? Uh, what service we're using you know, of all these different services. We know all of these things. We know uh, where the communication was sent. We know the cell tower, the high, you know, if it was off a Wi-Fi hotspot, what that was, if it was off a base station somewhere where that was. All that information is collected every time you make a phone call. All of this stuff is getting tracked. Um, and so that leads us to, to this next cartoon, uh, <laughs> the idea of, you know, what level of privacy you have. So that, I think, sets up you know what you're giving away um before we kind of get into the the next step here let's hold up on that poll for a second but brian is there anything else that you want to throw in before we start going into the how to get some of this privacy back are there you know i don't want to harp on it ad infinitum but there's well, something I, else I you want to add about what i think we a, give away. a lot of those different pieces of information um that we're giving away um, can just be collected in our use of a public Wi-Fi space, of a uh, Wi-Fi connection at work. I mean, it, you often don't even need um, a application or a particular consent agreement to give away that information that is easily identifiable to you. Yep. It's all out there, all being collected all the time. Another poll. Uh, and this, by the way, I just want to give credit. Um, I'm now forgetting the name of the person. Let me look through my attendees to see if I, if I recognize the name. I will call this person out by name. Hang on. Who was it? Who was it? Ah, I forget the name of the person. There was someone this week who emailed me this, this uh, quiz from the Pew Research. And I would highly recommend it to everybody. I will, I will dig out the link and throw it in the chat before I get to the end of this. But it's a 10-question cybersecurity quiz put together by Pew Research, and I, I took this question straight from it. And it's a pretty not super easy quiz. So I highly recommend it to folks. And if you're able to get through it and ace it, then kudos, because it is it has not been, uh, it's, it's not a super easy quiz. And this was one of the questions I thought was not a super gimme. Private browsing is featured in many internet browsers that let users access web pages without any information. So like incognito mode in, in Chrome, for example. So the question is, can internet service providers see the online activities uh, if you're using private browsing. So Ben, let's go ahead and pop that question up and interested to know what people think. Can your ISP still see your online activities when you use private browsing mode? Uh, can they still see them? This, of course, has been much in the news lately, right, of what your uh, subscribers, and this audience, our cybersecurity ninjas, are very on top of this. So Ben, we can go ahead and show this. Not a single person uh, believes that they cannot, and that is correct. Your ISP, of course, can still see all of your you know, searches, all of the websites that you visit, uh, depending on what you're encrypting or not encrypting, they can even see the information that you're entering in uh, to your browser and things like that. So that uh, is what it is. So before we uh, go into the things you can do to gain back a little privacy, we will, this, this section is gonna become a kind of frequent thing. So things experienced ninjas have learned already from previous uh, sessions of Cybersecurity Ninja. So first of all, keep your software up to date on your phone, on your computer, make sure everything's patched and current. That's just going to be very solid advice uh, for the foreseeable future. Using a password manager so that you have strong, unique uh, passwords for all of the services that you use. Obviously using two-factor authentication everywhere that you can. Encrypting your devices. So if your device goes into other hands, that all the information on your device is 
safe and encrypted and no one will be able to get it. Encrypting sensitive communications using a messaging app like Signal, encrypting <laughs> emails using something like CryptUp and just generally encrypting those sensitive communications and using a virtual private network or VPN. And one could say, you know, certainly when you're on a public Wi-Fi or on an unfamiliar network that you're concerned might not be secure. And increasingly, given the the new law that was just uh, passed or the restriction that was uh, removed that now allows our internet service providers to sell all of uh, the information about our internet histories from our homes, uh, you might want to just use a VPN all the time, although that doesn't 100% solve the problem, it's still at least something. So those are all things that our experienced ninjas hopefully already know. The next thing we'll suggest is to limit the kind, the amount of metadata that you share by default when you do things. And the picture that you're looking at here is all of the metadata, it's called EXIF, E-X-I-F, and it is the default information that is stored with any photograph that you take from a typical smartphone or digital camera. And with a smartphone, you won't have the little GPS information that's there, this does, a smartphone will, by default, tell where the photo was taken, when it was taken, it will say, uh, you know, uh, what camera, make and model it was, it'll give you all this other information about the photo. So if you simply, you know, you're out at the cafe and you have a beautiful meal in front of you and you say, hey, I'll take a picture of this and post it up to Twitter, uh, you've just given away all of that information about what phone you use, about where you were, what time you were there, uh, and that is now part of the permanent interactive piece of metadata that you have willingly put online so that you could share your meal, which by the way, if that's just something you're fine with, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not in any way suggesting that that's not something that's okay to do. I just want folks to be aware that you're doing that. Yeah, and I think that's the really important part here is that being aware of what you're sharing and then controlling or selectively sharing the things that you want to, um, this type of education over what information can be data mined from the things you're doing is something that we have to do with clients whenever we deal with stalking and domestic violence issues because people just aren't aware that that single photo has so much other rich, deep information, including their location, that a, a stalker can use against you or your family. So being aware of it and then limiting it is really the best strategy there. The other thing that I really liked about the uh, last slide and some of the other things that have been covered, you really have a series of seven different levels where information is getting shared and being aware of each of those different levels unfortunately is needed in order to limit your sharing. Uh, devices at this point don't have a single button that says um, stop sharing location that turns off all of those levels. They often have a button that turns off one of those levels and the other six are still on. And digging through that stuff to find that, where I'll have some specifics for the iPhone users out there. And then if I had better content that was easy, but it's different on all that different Android versions and phones. So I, there was, but so it's hard to provide a single thing for that. And yeah, one of just just as a quick heads up, one of the poll questions that I had in my draft, which I got rid of, was does Twitter know uh, where your children go to school and what time they get out of school? And uh, that was the one that, you know, for someone who, you know, often goes to the playground to pick up their kids, takes photos and posts them, the answer to that is, of course, then yes, because that information, you're, you're just putting it all online. Uh, Privacy Paradox, it was a project that was run by a podcast in a w, uh, NYC pro podcast called Note to Self, which for people who want to learn more about this on an ongoing basis, uh, they really do a terrific job of discussing and talking about privacy issues uh, on that podcast on an ongoing basis. And one of the really interesting things that this shows is around uh, location services. Um, how many different apps were looking for access to your location? Uh, and just by toggling that off and not giving those apps access to your location, now your photos don't have your location information on them and other things as well. And obviously this limits some functionality. If you don't give Google Maps access to your location, then it's 
got, going to be a lot less functional for you. So there, and there's a lot of, um, on the iPhone anyway, there's the ability to give something access only when you're using the app, and that's always going to be recommended. There's to never give it access, and I recommend that for any app that doesn't have any reason to need your location, like, you know, uh, uh, Twitter. I don't know why it needs to know where you are other than to give more information to Twitter. And uh, there really are, is no app that I can think of with, that needs it all the time. So uh, we're we're on the opposite ends here. Um, okay, uh, go ahead. I'm, a, I'm a power user, and I use geolocation um, in services where I actively broadcast where I am, and then meet up with people, especially when traveling, that I haven't seen for years because they get pings back and forth. So, for example. Facebook knows where I am, tells people when I'm around, I'm going to be in Boston this week. I haven't been there for about two years. I am sure that I'll run into two or three people because of that. But I'm proactively opting in and aware that I am doing it. There are use cases for these type of technologies, but being aware is the most important part here. And that, I, I thank you so much for saying that, Brian. And I, yeah, and I, I want to repeat what uh, Brian said there because I don't I think he's doing a much better job than me of kind of giving the general idea that it which is not that you know you shouldn't share anything online <laughs> and I feel that I'm, I'm unfortunately coming off that way I am you know clearly a bit more private privacy focused I think uh, than Brian is and that's my choice right Brian gets a lot of value out of different types of online engagement and that requires more but again he's doing it consciously knows what he's sharing and is making that choice and I 100% respect that and would never tell anyone not to do that I just want people to be aware of it and I apologize if I'm coming off as sort of hey you should lock all this stuff down that is not at all the intent so Brian thank you for for dialing that back no problem uh, and here's just another GIF on how to how to you know take back some of the location services and and restrict the different apps that do that and location history and all of these different things. So the location history is one of the things that I actually found uh, probably the scariest of all stuff or frequent locations rather, which is all the places that you go frequently that is tracked on your phone, which basically provides a history of of everywhere that you've been and provides that to lots of different applications that have access to that. And that was something that I didn't know that my phone was was uh, tracking for me. One other quick quick thing I just wanna mention, for, for those of you who are attending this who are frequenters of protests, if you go to, if you're you know part of uh, you know resistance at the moment, if you're doing a lot of protest work, um, this is, and, and Brian, you could probably speak to this as well on the, on the police side, but it's pretty clear that, that the police and law enforcement are pretty comfortable in their legal protection of taking your hand and pressing your thumb down on your phone to unlock it so that they can take a look at the contents of your phone. But they are not comfortable uh, coercing you into giving them your four digit or six digit pass key to unlock the phone. And they're also on much shakier legal ground if they try to coerce you to do that. And for that reason, if you are in a position where you think you may encounter law enforcement and want to have privacy from your mobile device, I recommend turning off Touch ID, that's just kind of a little safety tip uh, to again, protect your privacy if you happen to encounter law enforcement. Just a quick tip there. Yeah, Do you this, have anything you want to add to that, this Brian? Is a, this is a really interesting one and it's it's one of those that's currently uh, being litigated, but your, your protection of your password, um, it's much tougher for them to take that and you are at least going to get an opportunity to have a day in court and uh, get some representation from people like Electronic Frontier Foundation that care a lot about issues like this um, in order to try to protect that uh, in that passcode under some type of uh, either self-incrimination or free speech type doctrine where the biological information is very, 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 very difficult and they've often got the information from you before you can even contest it. So. But this is a cutting area where there are a lot of people trying to do cases and litigation on it. It is not settled at all. Yep. Uh, do you still, would you would you agree with that advice for the time being, though, Brian? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, okay. definitely. Okay. I think having having the passcode is definitely more recognized as legally protectable. Another one of those examples where law school makes you give precise answers that don't actually help people, put the <laughs> passcode in. That's helpful. That's <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Having passcode better than not having passcode, for sure. 
Uh, all right, and and the thing here that's interesting is that yeah, we we give you know so much information freely to app developers, you know, to Pokemon Go or Niantic, and you know, to to Twitter and Facebook and and Google and all of the different mobile apps that we have. And so many of these apps, when you install them and you just kind of click, it it, ha it flashes by that screen of like all the permissions it's going to ask for, and you're of course allow because you just want to get to playing the game or using the app or doing whatever, and don't realize that you just gave it access to your entire location history, your photos, your <laughs> You know, your contact list. Uh, so pay attention to uh, what you're giving permission to with those apps. That's going hey, to help it is going to be things that you did not consider in any way, shape, or form. Like the, there's like little throw a piece of paper into a waste basket app where you're just playing basketball with a waste basket and it gets access to your contacts and to your pictures. It There is no nexus between what you think the app does and the information it's collecting. I think that there needs to be some type of regulation or other things that look at that. But currently it's the wild west and lots of apps collect a lot more information than they need to for their legitimate business purpose. Oh yeah. yeah. And so I'm sorry, just to weigh in a little bit here. And that's that's not to say that every app that has the or asks for those permissions uh, actually collects and you know uses that data, which actually makes it worse because um, so those permissions are based on the actual underlying code and and what it actually needs to complete that you know throw a paper into a basket uh, animation and scoring and all that. Sometimes they use um, code from different parts of the operating system and don't actually need contact data or anything, but they need a specific command that comes as a part of that, um, that section of the operating system. The reason it could be more uh, harmful is because if someone discovers that they don't actually need that or a way to hack that app, that data could be collected without both the user knowing or the developer knowing in certain cases. So it actually opens it up. So it's it's another reason to be extra vigilant about um, the permissions that you give these apps and uh, on your on your mobile devices, especially so. 100% agree. Very, very good point there. The more places your information in, in a nutshell and, and Ben, that was an awesome point. But the more places your information winds up, the more opportunities there are for that information to get into the wrong hands and, and, and be freed and those apps are doing it. And yeah, the, the paper app, there could, you know, I can think of one really legitimate reason why I want my contact. It's probably got a share button in it. And when you share it and it wants to like, you know, send a promo code to a friend and you know, if you sign up five friends, you get all these extra points in it. Well, it needs, it wants to pull those emails from your contact list. So for that function, it wants access to your contact. That's why it asks for it. Do you want to give it that? That's a different question. All right, last uh, last poll question here. We're in the home stretch here for for those of you. Sorry, we're running long. I did I did warn you up front. True or false? Turning off the GPS function of your smartphone prevents any tracking of your phone's location. This is also from that Pew uh, cybersecurity thing. And again, I will get that link up. So go ahead and answer that. And our audience is hip to our questions. Oh no, we got a couple of couple of people who, who missed this one. So let's go ahead and show the results for that one, Ben. Uh, so 92% of thought that is false. Turning off the Jeep prevents any tracking of your phone. Uh, it is false, and it, basically your phone can be tracked very, to very I believe within six meters, something like that, uh, from cell phone towers. So as it unless you put your phone in airplane mode or turn it off or put it in a Faraday bag, which we'll, which we'll talk about in a minute, then, uh, then your phone is connecting with local towers and those towers can tell where your phone is, whether or not your GPS function is enabled. So uh, it still knows. All right, your DIY Faraday bag. Uh, this is put in here, I would say 30% in jest, <laughs> 70%. Uh, unironically, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know how those percentages work out, but uh, basically it's a thing you can put your phone in and if you really are somewhere and you just want to make sure that you're not being tracked, but you have your phone with you, it's something you can flip your phone in and as far as we know, your phone's not going to be giving away any information to anyone uh, about what it's doing or where it is or anything like that if it's in this bag. And uh, I'm, I'm encouraging some of my crafty relatives to, to make me a really stylish uh, Faraday pouch that I can carry around with me. And I'm 
going to sell them on Etsy if that uh, comes to it. All right, so privacy tools and services. We didn't get into how-tos for, for all of these. Uh, uh, some of these I have gone into. I'm just going to run through them very quick. Tor, everybody on this webinar series should know about that by this point. It's a private web browser uh, that gives you a very, very good degree of privacy. Nothing is 100% perfect, but Tor is pretty great. Uh, Signal, which is an encrypted messaging app that gives you privacy for your instant messaging, as long as you're communicating with someone else who's also on Signal. Panopticlick, which let's, is uh, let's talk about ahead. Signal for just for just a second, um, and also just running into apps. There are a lot of apps out there that uh, claim to do um, private communications or to delete things after you send it, that type of stuff. Uh, Snapchat got themselves in a bunch of trouble because their definition of delete was not actually to delete things. It was to stop letting you look at it, and it was still around on your phone. They've since fixed that. Whenever you are choosing one of these apps, um, go. Out, these are all well vetted, but there's a lot out in there, the app store that aren't. You've got to do the research and make sure that what it says that it does has actually been vetted by security professionals, uh, because there's a lot of lazy coding going on in this space, um, and Signal is a great one. Uh, also, with this type of sharing stuff, I think that there's a second person to think about in any of these instances. I overshare, share huge amounts, but I also deal with client data and I have some friends that do not share. So I have a different set of standards when interacting with them, the channels that I use for those particular individuals. So you need to consider the privacy choices of the people that you're working with. I have a separate email address that doesn't go to Google, that has the ability to do PGP encryption for people that that really matters to. I've got like three people who emailed me on that address, but the option is there and that is essential when dealing with client data or someone else's private data, even if you love to share everything as I do. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and I will continue on through these. And I, yeah, and I have done my best to vet all the things that the links and the things that I provide next week where we go over tools and services, I will, or two weeks, I'm sorry. I will also work to only present uh, resources that we have vetted and that we feel a high degree of confidence in. And, you know, I, I will constantly be evaluating and looking at these lists and, and making decisions about what kind of what goes on and comes off based on what I'm reading. And it's, it's tough. I mean, I've, I've learned a lot even over the course of this series about, you know, new services or ones that I thought were good that I now think aren't good, especially in the VPN space, by the way, where I, uh, I've learned a lot over the last couple of months. A quick ahead, note on the fourth one, I believe that's uh, HTTPS everywhere, not anywhere. Um, it's oh, by yeah. Electronic <laughs> Frontier Foundation. <laughs> So it, it is an amazing browser uh, plugin. It's great, very, very useful. Yep, I could fix that right now. That's a great catch, thank you. And it looks like I've got the wrong link to it anyway. So clearly I have some, we have some cleanup to do before we uh, share the deck tomorrow. <laughs> All right, uh, everywhere, there we go. Okay. Yep. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you for that. So Panopticlick is a tool that lets you check on the privacy level of your browser. So you can see sort of what your browser is sharing about you and we can make some suggestions about things you can fix. HTTPS everywhere forces everything into a uh, secure connection or encrypted connection in your browser. That along with using a VPN on your home network will give you, if you're concerned about the privacy in terms of what you're sharing with your internet service providers, uh, those two things together using a VPN at home and using HTTPS everywhere. Uh, will will help with that. Uh, it does break a lot of websites, and that's something that you should, I wouldn't just say a lot, but it does definitely impede the functionality of a fair amount of sites. Privacy Badger, uh, these are, by the way, Panopticlick, HTTPS Everywhere, uh, Privacy Badger, all from uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, which Brian mentioned before. Uh, CryptUp is an encrypted messaging uh, plugin for Gmail that uses PGP to send encrypted messages to folks. Very, very easy to use. I demonstrated that a couple of uh, sessions ago. DNS Crypt encrypts your DNS queries. That's a product uh, that the OpenDNS distributes. DuckDuckGo is a secure, uh, more anonymous uh, search engine that you can use in place of Google if you wanna have a little bit more privacy around your searching. And then of course, the note self privacy paradox and then the link to the DIY fairy bag uh, thing. So key success factors, 
understand what you're sharing. Uh, Brian has, has uh, articulated this so eloquently throughout the session today, but share thoughtfully. Don't stop sharing. That's not the message of this webinar. It's not to disconnect from all these devices. It's not to stop sharing anything. It's just to share thoughtfully. Uh, think about limiting what metadata you share and at least being aware of what metadata you're sharing. Use two-factor authentication and encrypt as much as possible. Browse with Tor uh, if you want any privacy. Uh, use a virtual private network. Get active. Uh, certainly legislation changes can make it harder or easier for us to have privacy on our digital communications and being active around things like net neutrality and uh, the ability of ISPs to sell our information and the regulations around uh, what apps need to tell you about what information they're collecting. All of that you know, certainly makes a big, big difference. So that's another thing you do. And then stay informed. And I can't really emphasize that enough. This stuff changes so fast. And there's, it's so complex, a lot of this, that, that staying informed will really help you on that. Is there anything you want to add to any of that, Brian? I guess uh, one thing that I really recommend is that it, it is impossible for anybody to be an expert on this, um, but there are people out there who are going to know a, an amount of information that's well above you for any one of these areas. Um, if you've got any questions, take them to your IT staff, take them to your friends um, who are interested in information technology. Those of us who understand coding and understand how this foundation works. We love to talk about this stuff and we're happy to help. And, and I would add to that, you know, just like you would vet your resources for things, think about the perspective of the person you're talking to. I, you know, I'd like to think mm -hmm. that I'm a pretty reasonable, you know, not fear mongering person, but over just over the course of the session today, I've realized, you know, that I, when I talk about this can not perhaps be uh, as as kind of, uh, I don't know, an even-handed perspective around issues of privacy and digital security. So whereas Brian, I think, has much more open views about sharing and, and things like that. So, so be thoughtful of, you know, before you get all frightened by somebody who says, oh, you got to lock all this stuff down, you know, realize everybody's got a perspective. <laughs> and, yep. and, and, and it's important to know where the person's coming from. I hope that, that's helpful. All right, and with that, I think we are, uh, we have some resources for further reading. I have the link to Apply Magic Sauce, the Privacy Paradox Tip Sheet, which is from Note to Self. I really like that resource, by the way, on, on the privacy level, and then a few other things that are in there. Next session, Ninja Toolkit, May 2nd, 2 p.m., and that whole session is going to be all the different tools and services and different things that can help you improve your cybersecurity. Uh, and so that's that's going to be that session. I believe we're going to have a return guest for that one, which will be Keith Berner from uh, Freedom House. And I will very much look forward to him. He's compiled an incredibly comprehensive list of cybersecurity resources. And with that, we are uh, open to questions. If anyone has them, I don't see any in the, in the links. But if anyone has it, now is your time to type them in. I want to give a huge thanks to Brian Rowe for joining us today. Uh, thanks, as always, of course, to Ben Gardner as well. And thank you all for attending today. And it's been terrific. Brian, I really thank you so much. Your, uh, thank you so much terrific. for having me. Yeah. I, I yeah. greatly appreciate it. The topic is just so important overall. Um, and I look forward to seeing the rest of the um, pieces in this series and sharing the videos from it. Great. We do have a question is, uh, which is, can you scrub any data that is already out there? Metadata scrubbing. So Brian, do you want to take a crack at that one? Or so you know if you have physical control of the device and it hasn't been shared, there are options to do that. Once a third party gets a hold of it, it is virtually impossible and you have almost no right in the US to do that. When you delete your Facebook account, it doesn't mean it gets deleted. It means you no longer get access to it and it's probably sitting on a backup server somewhere. There are um, some areas in the European Union where you have the right to view the information that a company has about you and you may even have the right to at least have it corrected if not deleted, but those are not things that we have in the US and it once shared, it's out there and it stays out there forever. Thank you so much. And yeah, that is 100% true. If you have control over it, then yes, you can you can delete it or clean it before. It's, it's pretty hard to clean it if it's already got the metadata in it. Uh, you just have to not share it, essentially. But uh, 
but if you if it's already out there it's, it's already out there Right. For litigation or other things, there are some tools where if you've got a photo and you want to scrub some of the metadata before sharing it with the other party, there are options to do that. Um, oh, yes. Definitely. Yeah. Talk to your tech staff about that. And there are tools you can do that. Actually, there are apps you can put there. The EXIF, I was doing some research on it. There's like an EXIF remover thing that just, that just pulls off the EXIF information from photos before you share them and then you share them out from that. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Is there a recommended virtual private networking service? I use Avast at home and they offer a VPN. And Brian, I, I have I do have some thoughts on this because I did some additional research for this for this session, also for the one two weeks ago, but I will I'll let you take the first crack at it if you have a thought on it. Um this this is one that I do not have a good answer uh, to. I'm I'm curious to hear what what you say about it. We we've set up our own virtual private network through Northwest Justice project using Cisco tools, but um, I don't know. I'm curious what you suggest here. Yeah, I mean, I, I will have to say this article from Brian Krebs from Krebs and Security was, uh, I, I would recommend reading. It is in the links for, so everybody will get the slide deck tomorrow, but Krebs and Security should you VPN, that link is there. And he um, has a links to a massive spreadsheet of VPN. I'm going to go ahead and find it. Side there it is. Side by side comparison of many popular VPN services. So this is a simple VPN, a simple VPN comparison chart. So it gives you a on all of these different categories uh, how that this particular VPN service ranks. So you can look at business ethics, pricing. Uh, technical availability, technical security, and kind of think about what you care about the most and sort of pick from here. And if, if you browse through this massive list, which has, I forget how many entries in it, it's over 100, um, then you can um, kind of see which ones rise to the top. And there definitely were a few. Uh, you can see like Bull HVPN is one that, you know, where, where you see a lot of green essentially across, but you'd want to decide, determine which are the most critical categories for you and then choose them. And I would say ultimately, if your organization provides a VPN as Brian was talking about, so if, if you have a network that you control and a VPN service through your firewall provider or something like that, that's probably going to be your best option and your most secure and your most private option, notwithstanding that you know your employer or whoever manages that network will still know what you're browsing on that VPN, but no one else will. All right, what is the difference between Tor and VPN? Ooh, good question. Brian, you want to take a crack at that or you want me to take a crack yeah, at that? Yeah, um, so VPN, you're basically setting up a, co a connection between two um, computers or two groups or two networks um, where Tor is taking the traffic and routing it through a bunch of different nodes, making it virtually impossible um, to track how it goes through that process. So there's really kind of different use cases for both of them and they are compatible. Um, you can uh, use Tor um, and a VPN. You can, they're not uh, mutually exclusive technologies. Excellent. Yeah, and I've been I've been messing around with different using the I mean this will get for for those of you that are not sort of Uber nerds, um, I apologize, but I've been messing around uh, with the Panopticlick tool and other tools, um, the browser fingerprints, and just to see what level of an anonymity I can produce within my own environment. And so the best thing I've been able to do so far is running on my MacBook in something called VirtualBox. I run a virtual Windows 10 computer run a VPN out of that and then boot up Tor on that VPN and it that seems to <laughs> you know limit most of the information that they have it makes the browser fingerprint very very limited in terms of information it shares but that's obviously a lot more work than anyone's going to want to do uh, just to get some kind of basic privacy but that uh, anyway that does it. these are great questions by the way all right another that's question right. coming in and, and Brian if you have to go I, I totally understand I, I can hang out for a few more. No problem. Okay, sure. Uh, I assume Office 365 collects metadata too. Should we limit sharing clients' information in there? Uh, this is a good question. In terms of client information and things like that, again, the metadata, you know, is mostly a risk if you're talking about um, 
people with you know government access because in order to really get access to a lot of the metadata right you'd have to have access to the the tools that are giving you that information so within office 365 unless you're sharing it publicly right the metadata is not available to anyone other than you know government enforcement who would subpoena that information right as opposed to if i put a photograph on twitter then the entire world has access to all the metadata of that post they know what time i make that post they know what type of phone i posted it from they know the geographic location i posted it from all that uh, brian go ahead you were going to no, and, and this is one of those very um, practical areas where it, it depends on who you are really worried about having access to the information directly. Um, I know lots of law firms that use either Google or Office 365 um, to keep client data uh, with secure connections to those particular services. Um, but if, if you are dealing with the government as an adversary party, then I definitely don't recommend using those and coming up with a way that um, you have access to the physical servers and then you are aware when a security letter or, a, or something is asked for because you're not necessarily going to be notified um, if it's a third party. So, But it is definitely a best practice in law that there are lots of people who use cloud services and there are some ways to take cloud services and encrypt stuff that is stored with them, but you're going to lose a huge amount of the functionality around search. Um, we one of our more popular videos was on using um, box cryptor with Dropbox so that we could um, leave stuff encrypted for clients via a Dropbox uh, somewhere where I normally wouldn't put client data but I was fine as long as they it was encrypted on the way over there and while sitting there but then of course it doesn't show up in searches on your box drive right so right, right search for that document it doesn't show up in the search because it's encrypted so search can't index it exactly uh, you're gonna lose a bunch hope, of functionality that way and yeah so i hope that is a helpful answer for for the folks who asked that question and if this, not you of course know to follow up and uh someone has pointed out of course that the nsa now knows how i'm trying to anonymize my browser yeah I, um, <laughs> <laughs> like i had going back to you know the original, a lot more about me <laughs> yeah yeah going back to the original i i was going very first slide, right? I, I have nothing to hide. I'm, I'm not doing anything illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Josh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the other um, thing also to consider about that question is we're also considering the difference between the content of a document or an email message and the metadata. As far as the metadata is concerned, Microsoft absolutely collects your metadata on emails and things like that, because it allows them to, you know, they data mine that stuff um, and they can use it in, you know, commercial means or, or what have you. And certainly Google does that as well. Uh, that's what most of their business is based on. Um, as far as the content of the message itself or the content of a document, you're really, like Brian said, you're limited by the security that you place on that device or that, um, that document or that email itself. As far as a a company like Microsoft being able to read your email, it's it's less likely, but it's certainly possible. Um, and if you're trying to protect it from a government entity, like a subpoena or something like that, they're almost certainly going to turn it over, especially if they're in the United States, as we talked about a few weeks ago with um, blind subpoenas and you know gag orders and things like that. But as far as the metadata of the emails, um, that it's certainly gathered, but the content itself is is is, is protected much better than the metadata because the metadata is what really is mined and used to track and you know it goes into that big NSA database but the content itself at least in the United States is generally not collected because it's illegal to or as far as we are all aware. so um, just that little piece of clarification there and and I also would, would say that metadata I don't know if it's like we say collected as though like metadata is just created like all the time. Everything you do digitally generates metadata essentially. And so how much is collected depends on the organization, but you are producing metadata all the time. Uh, anyway. Uh, yep. All right. I think that that is it for our questions. I actually do have to get going because I have a three o'clock. Uh, I can't thank everybody enough. Great questions. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, no problem. Happy happy to do it, and I look forward to the rest of the series. Take care. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody.